Thank you kindly. Take me just a moment to set up here. I should mention about my choice of clothing. Being in Asia, I really should have worn my batik, which is far more comfortable than these awful Western clothes. But then I would have a problem. I would have to alternate day by day Indonesian batik and Malaysian batik so that my various friends would not be angry or upset with me. Normally when I speak wearing Western clothes, I have a red tie. But that seemed inappropriate uh, for a discussion of equality and inequality. Now, the topic I'm going to address is about inequality. And as you know, there's been increasing discussion of the issue of inequality all around the world. It's taken several forms, and in some cases, political movements have been orchestrated to make the issue a much more prominent topic of discussion. I'll take a very prominent example. The Occupy Wall Street movement of 2011 featured literally hundreds and hundreds of people in New York who occupied a very tiny space of real estate known as Zakati Park. It's an area no one else had ever heard of that was used by smokers on Wall Street were not allowed to smoke in the building. So it was the place the smokers would go and congregate. A group of people assembled there and occupied it, so they could occupy Wall Street. And they presented the following list of demands. Free college education, completely ending the use of fossil fuels, spending $1 trillion on physical infrastructure in the United States, planting forests, creating open borders, forgiving all debts, but especially student debts, student loans, and outlawing all credit reporting agencies and imprisoning people who work for them. Now the real impact of the movement was not promoting any of those incoherent and contradictory demands. But just in planting one single idea, very memorable or very sticky, to use the language of marketers, idea in the minds of hundreds of millions of people. Namely, that in the matter of incomes, we can identify those who receive 99% of the income and those others who receive 1% of the income. So it turns out, it, isn't, it is true that 100% of the people receive 100% of the income, but it was a surprise to some that 1% receive some amount that's greater than some other percentage. It's a very sticky idea, this idea of the 99% and the 1%, or a meme, to use the term that Richard Dawkins, Dawkins invented, to describe a unit of cultural transmission modeled on the idea of a gene. Of course, it's virtually a truism, but it was packaged with a sense of moral outrage that there should be any such distinction. Moreover, by phrasing the distinction between the 99% and the 1%, it suggested that the members of those groups, notably the 1%, are constant. That there's no movement in and out of that group. There's somehow us and them, the other 1%. It was also very important, from a marketing perspective, the distinction was not between the 60% and the 40%, or the 80% and the 20%, or even the 90% and the 10%, partly because most people see themselves as potentially for at least some part of their lives, in that 40%, or 20%, or 10%. So if not for themselves, then for their children, family members, and friends. But let's set aside for the moment the term distribution, along with its related term, beloved by those who use such language, allocation. They never use such terms as production or creation. You will not find it 
in their books or articles. It's all about distribution or allocation. I want to focus on the power of that simple mean, the 90%, 99% and the 1%. It was proposed by a movement that is openly and proudly anti-globalization. And it went global very, very quickly. There's a little double irony in that, to which I'll return in a moment. During and after the occupation of that little park in New York, I actually went and visited, looking for someone with something coherent to say. But after that, I found that theme repeated in Brazil, when I would go and speak at universities in India, in Germany, in South Africa, all over the world, people were talking about the 99% and the 1%. So the idea very quickly circled the globe. By singling out the 1% or a 1%, the organizers of Occupy Wall Street, not to be confused with Occupy Central with Peace and Love, suggested an evil conspiracy of a tiny minority of plutocrats against all the rest of us. Because all the rest of us are almost certainly in the 99%, not in the 1%. Now, I mentioned that there's a little bit of a double irony in the globalization of this 99%, 1% mean. First, there's the globalization of an anti-globalization message that's mildly ironic. It's a bit like extreme techno-primitivists tweaking their views. It's amusing. But much more important is that while the occupiers were complaining about alleged increases in inequality in their society, global inequality has been declining quite rapidly for over 20 years, consistently. Attendees at this forum are much more likely to be aware of that fact than the fabulously wealthy protesters occupying Zuccotti Park, who live in the top 1% of the planet's income distribution. All of them. Now, the rise of incomes in Indonesia and Vietnam and on massive scales in China and India since the openings initiated in 1978-1991, respectively, have shifted the balance of wealth around the world very dramatically as many recent detailed studies have shown. That got no attention. And in fact, globally, inequality is falling. Moreover, another form of global shifting of the ratios of wealth has taken place in the wealthy countries that have seen net immigration. The immigration to the United States, for example, of low-income migrants from Central America and some other regions is a substantial reason for the differential between the Gini coefficients, measures of inequality, that characterize the United States and Western Europe, countries that are often contrasted to the United States. The German economist and the journalist, he's currently editor of Die Welt, and was formerly North American editor of Wirtschaftswoche, Olaf Gersemann, wrote a wonderful book on this issue some years ago under the title Amerikanische Verhältnisse. And the German speakers understand that's an insult. American conditions or American relations. And in Germany, you used to hear politicians say, we don't want any American conditions here in Germany. And what he did in that book, which I participated in translating into English and publishing as Cowboy Capitalism, is to look at the degree to which different societies met the criteria of social democratic standards of justice. Was it Germany, France, and Italy, the poor Eurozone countries, or the wicked, evil United States? And he's pointed out consistently by the own standards of social democrats, their societies were less just than the United States. Well, one of the things he noted that was particularly interesting was about the impact of immigration on the Gini coefficient. And I quote, the number of poor people and the level of poverty rate in America can in part be explained by the immigration boom of the last 30 years. In contrast with Europe's much more restrictive immigration policies, the United States allows not just highly qualified immigrants into the country, but many poorly educated people as well, especially from Latin American countries. The lion's share of immigrants manages within relatively little time to catch up 
with income levels of average Americans. It's true nonetheless that many immigrants spend their first years in the United States in poverty. Between 1973 and 2002, the number of immigrants from Latin America in the United States grew from 10.8 million to 39.2 million. At the same time, they went from 10 to 25 percent of the poor in the United States. Thus, he concludes, there would have been a simple way for the United States to fight poverty, close its borders. However, that that would have helped the millions of Hispanics who want to try to make a living north of the Rio Grande is rather doubtful. So the Gini coefficient could have been lowered in the United States by not allowing people from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico to enter the United States. The U.S. would have scored higher, lower Gini coefficient. But would anyone's lives have been made better? The people who continue to languish in poverty in small villages in Honduras without access to medical care, education in rural Mexico, would they have been better off? Well, the statisticians would have been very pleased. And indeed, I'll talk about statisticians in a moment. So you could eliminate the differential in the Gini coefficient by making other people's lives worse. Now, as the global campaign against the 1% was spreading its single contribution to the discourse of politics. Most of the other demands for open borders and so on uh, were quickly forgotten. Just the 90%, 99%, 1% is the only residue of that movement. During that time, a French economist named Thomas Piketty, thank you, Professor uh, Sally, was writing a major work with a complementary, but rather more sophisticated thesis. It came out in 2013 in French, and an English translation was published earlier this year. Here it is. It's a rather hefty and substantial book. It, too, does not address global inequalities in any detail. Almost no mention of that. But focuses on just a few countries, the US, Britain, Canada, in France. One of his arguments being, well, we have longer term data for those countries than for others. It's a bit like a gentleman who was on his hands and knees under a street lamp. He's asked by the police, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. And he says, well, if your car is all the way over there. He says, yes, but the light is better here. <laughs> now, much could be said about Piketty's thesis. And much has already been said. There are already some wonderful reviews. I should point out, I've met a fair number of people who cite the book approvingly, and I ask one of those embarrassing questions. I said, really, it's very interesting. Have you read the book? Uh, no. So, okay, well, what is the basic thesis of the book? Um, uh, Maybe some of them know R is bigger than G. So, okay, very good. You get this gold star. What does it mean? I have yet to meet one person who has cited the book approvingly to me who understands the thesis. It's a rather more subtle thesis than most people think. To his credit, Professor Piketty posted all of the statistical data online, and it has been subject to the criticisms he invited. And I respect that, and I admire that. He's undertaken a huge effort to assemble as much data as he can. And if I believed in the labor theory of value, I would consider this tremendously valuable, because a lot of labor went into it. I'm not much of a statistical expert to criticize the data. I am enough of an economist, however, to know that he's a much stronger statistician than he is an economist is indicated by claims such as the following. I had to read this many times and check with other economists before I was sure it didn't make any sense. He says, if supply is insufficient, this is not the kind of language economists use. What does insufficient mean? And price is too high, that's in quotes. But what is too high? I just don't understand what that means, relative to what? But he says, if supply is insufficient and price is too high, 
then demand for that good should decrease. Which should lead to a decrease in its price. That's the sort of silliness that I learned not to say in my first week of my freshman microeconomics class. The distinction between the amount demanded, or a shift along the demand curve, and a shift in the demand curve is really fundamental. And I don't think he understands that. So I'm not questioning his intelligence. He's a very intelligent person. Or his mathematical abilities, which certainly surpass mine. But I don't think he understands economics. And the book is littered for such things. Also, as a statistician, he focuses on aggregates and then asks about their movements and interrelationships without ever disaggregating and asking just what is going on that it might have generated those aggregate data. In his view, capital just grows. And then there is a distribution of income. Wealth and income are never produced, made, created. They happen. They just happen, and then there's a distribution. Now, without covering too much ground, covered by many other presenters, I want to direct attention to his puzzling view of the nature of capital, which he asserts repeatedly without evidence, always tends to be converted into mere rents. He asks of those who might be potential doubters, quote, what could be more natural to ask of a capital asset? I've actually never asked anything of a capital asset. But what could be more natural to ask of a capital asset than that it produced a reliable and steady income? That is, in fact, the goal of a perfect capital market as economists define it. Namely, it's how one would describe the returns to capital in a world that never changes in any way. In the return to capital would be simply interest in a world that never changed. And of course, that's the one all you economists think is perfect. It's the one you yearn for, a world that never changes. This is a classic example of misrepresentation of what economists and certain liberal economists believe. It seems to be, however, the only world that draws the attention of Piketty the statistician Quote, he does concede, by the way, quote, capital is never quiet. It is always risk-oriented and entrepreneurial. Seems to contradict the earlier claim, at least at its inception. Yet, he says, it always tends to transform itself into rents as it accumulates in large enough amounts. That is its vocation, its logical destination, close quote. So it's a key part of his claim to have discovered, like his master Karl Marx, the fundamental laws of capitalism. And he uses this repeatedly. The first law of capitalism and the second law of capitalism. He has unlocked the laws of the world. It's inevitable destination. As he says, its logical destination is for capital to transform itself simply into ransom. Phrase it as interest. Now, if it were true that capital just grows and does so at a rate faster than the economy as a whole, the rise of gross domestic product, then not only would capital, and I put this in quotes because he considers it a mass, capital, come to get ever higher shares of national income, but the same people would be in the list from year to year always be the same people, because their capital, their wealth, would grow faster than the economy as a whole. That's not the case. Nor are the wealthier in market economies the descendants or heirs of the landed gentry of the 18th century. This should be fairly obvious to anyone who just looked at lists of wealthy entrepreneurs and founders of companies, and so on. The idea that liberals understood, formulated in the old phrase, from rags to riches to shirt sleeves in three generations. Or to translate it for a statistician, regression to the mean, which is the more standard behavior of what we should expect. Now it's quite remarkable that in measuring capital, 
Piketty completely and deliberately excludes human capital. And his discussion of this I found really remarkable. He dismisses it and suggests that people who are interested in measurement of human capital are advocates of slavery, which is a really underhanded and low, but I am afraid to say typical, of his method uh, move. I find that ought to do to consider human capital not a form of capital, and then to question the motives of those who think human capital is a mode of capital, when we consider the huge investments that people make in acquiring human capital. Just look at the students in Asia who study so furiously to get into universities, and whose afternoons, weekends, and evenings are occupied by preparation for examinations. I think all of us have witnessed this in one form or another. What are they doing? They're not doing it because it's fun. They're investing in their future and in their human capital. Now, Piketty claims that capital can always be substituted for labor. Notice one of the points is he doesn't want to consider human capital. And in his calculations of the growth of the capital stock, and thus the ratio between capital and income, human capital is not included. Despite the fact that people manifestly invest huge amounts in order to acquire that human capital. Now, his consideration is that we can always substitute capital for labor. But here's the interesting point. What is the biggest component of the rising capital stock in various countries in recent years? It's the rise in the value of the housing stock, which he considers to be capital. Well, as Kevin Hassett of the American Enterprise Institute noted, his theory that we're going to substitute capital for labor falls apart in his own data. Because the capital is all housing. And you can't substitute a house for a worker. So it's very puzzling that his measurement of the growth of the capital stock includes a huge amount of housing, but doesn't include human capital. Now, another interesting point. Piketty is not focusing on the suffering or the poverty of the poor. They play at best a walk-on role for him. He shows little or no concern for the poor. To put it rather directly, if he were concerned about them, he would be cheering on the raising of incomes in Asia and Africa and had asking how to promote more of that. How do we get more of that? Even at the cost of some increase in inequality in the countries of North America and Western Europe. But all he cares about is the change in the Gini coefficient, or in this case the ratio of capital to income, in a few select very rich countries. So I'm not so sure he's interested in the status of the poor. He doesn't even pre propose redistribution of income from the rich to the poor. What he proposes, rather, is just erasing the wealth of the rich. It's implicit in his statistical history of Western Europe, where so much wealth was destroyed in the 20th century because of disastrous cataclysmic wars, the eruption of mass insanity in Europe in various forms, not only World War I, but then the totalitarian regimes that followed the Soviet Union, Italy, and National Socialist Germany, and then World War II, and communism, and the Cold War, and so on. In some sense, that made the world better. It destroyed so much capital, it changed the capital to income ratios. Hurrah. Hurrah. I'm so happy about that. But it's of a piece with his approach to taxation of capital globally. It's not to fund global redistribution. I would have some respect for that. If he actually thought we could take wealth from rich people living in London, Paris, New York, and so on, and give it and enrich poor people living in Cambodia, I would have some respect for that. He does not propose that. The reason he proposes a global capital tax is not for purposes of global redistribution, but to make sure no one escapes. 
that you cannot get away to Luxembourg or the Cayman Islands or that there would be any tax competition among jurisdictions. So the global nature of the taxation he proposes has as its purpose merely to make sure no one can escape to Hong Kong or Vietnam or any place else that might offer less taxation. The point is not to raise the poor, it is exclusively to tear down the rich. That is his proposal. Now one could go on, but I won't. I want to address instead why I am an egalitarian and PKD and his followers are not. Why I believe in equality and they do not. Now that might sound a bit striking to some because I defend the justice of other people having more capital and income than I do. So am I not defending inequality? How could I claim to be an egalitarian when I think it's okay and just for other people to have more stuff than I have? I have several theses I want to offer to you. First, there are different kinds of goods the possession of which may be equalized. And the equalization of some may be incompatible with the equalization of others. If one seeks to exercise power to take from the rich, whether one gives to the poor, as Robin Hood did, or just tears down the rich, as PKD seeks, one is proposing an inequality in power. Those who can override the results of the decisions of consumers and markets have more power than those consumers. For example, those who buy Apple and Microsoft products, and thereby enrich Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, and Bill Gaines, uh, have exercised their power to allocate, distribute wealth voluntarily. Those who claim the power to override those decisions are claiming an inequality in political power. It is not surprising that those states that were the most dedicated to economic egalitarianism generated highly unegalitarian arrangements of political power in which certain elites, parties, had power and no one else did. And indeed it's worth looking at the actual history of uh, Communist China and the Communist Soviet Union and you see not only dramatic differences in political power but also differences in economic access to economic goods as well. It was hidden in a variety of forms. The Soviet distribution of income was extremely inegalitarian. The way they did that was by allocating resources not through the price system. So that the formal monetary incomes of a highly paid person and a low paid person were not that great. But the highly paid person had access to a nice flat, vacations, a car, a driver, better food, free lunches, at the office and the whole range of benefits, the right to shop in party member only shops or very Oscar shops and so on, all down the line. So the actual distribution was highly unequal and also distributed through informal systems. In the Russian language, the wonderful term blot, Russian is a very expressive language, blot meant the exchange of favors and privileges among people who had connections. And in China, we saw the elevation of Wang Shi, of the network that one has, which has always been present in all human societies, but acquired a much more significant role in communist societies in which price allocation was not as used, and consequently is the distribution and exchange of favors and power. Now that inequality of power, a power over oneself and over other people, that's what I find so objectionable. It's an inequality regarding the most basic of rights, the right to make decisions about one's own life with what is one's own. The holders of power claim the power and right to make decisions over their lives and over yours. They claim an unequal power over human lives. Now that leads to my second thesis, which I've already alluded to, that inequalities of political power inevitably lead to inequalities of wealth, income, and consumption. Those who acquire power over others in the name of making us all more equal 
Rather quickly learn that that power is itself a source of income and consumption. For many, of course, it's desirable for its own sake. Often the initial founders of a power regime seek power for its own sake because there's a fundamental cruelty in their heart. But their successors tend to focus much more on the good things in life they can get when they have power. It's desirable for the other good things it can bring. The fact is, all populist, economic, egalitarian regimes quickly become crony states, run by ruthless plutocrats. You don't have to look just into ancient history or the texts of ancient Greek or Roman historians. Look at Venezuela today, ruled by the Bolivarista movement, promising 21st century socialism, equality for all, dignity for everyone. What has it generated? Shortages, mass queues, privation, black markets, favoritism, and the rise of what they call in Venezuela the oligarchs. Oligarchs put into power by the Bolivarista movement, the oligarchs. Mega wealthy Bolivarista operatives who gained their wealth not by producing goods and services for sale in the market, but by their control of the levers of the power of the state. George Orwell phrased it so memorable, memorably in his parable of populist egalitarianism, Animal Farm. The initial slogan, all animals are equal, was transformed into the new form. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Now that process is inevitable. It is a rise from a fundamental and ineradicable inequality that characterizes forms of human interaction generally. The transactions cost of organizing small groups tend to be lower than the transactions cost of organizing large groups. And the state, because of its inclusive and monopolistic claims over a given population, makes it difficult for you to escape from its private from its predatory behavior. And it is thus able to spread the costs of its activities over large numbers of people and aggregate the resulting wealth and award it to smaller groups of people. Its own personnel, those who are influential, uh, and to do so at the expense of the wider population. So I'll take a very simple example in the United States. The populist movement that led to farm price supports and farm subsidies. Let's look at one example the sugar subsidy in the United States. Sugar growers constitute a very tiny percentage of the American population. Florida, Louisiana, where they grow king sugar, and in Iowa, where they grow beet sugar, which is the dumbest, most inefficient way to produce sugar ever discovered, and would not be used in the absence of these special subsidies. They extract huge amounts of wealth from the rest of the population by restricting imports of sugar from places that produce it more efficiently. Brazil, the Caribbean, take notable examples. So every time someone puts some sugar in his or her tea or coffee or as a cookie, it's a tiny bit more expensive than it would have been had we had free trade. But scarce one in a hundred thousand people are aware of that. When I go and talk to college campuses, I describe it, I give the, the details of the legislation, I ask, how many of you knew this? Usually the hand of the chair of the economics faculty goes up. That's it. No one knows they're being robbed every day by these subsidies. What we see is systematically transfers of wealth from the unorganized majority to the organized minority. This is characteristic of predatory state behavior been known as the Iron Law of Oligarchy. It means that states with such policies, interventionist policies, inevitably become, to one degree or another, crony states. Now, to be sure, there are other factors involved in determining the degree of cronyism in a country. Take, for example, the difference in the political cultures between Sweden, which is largely culturally and ethnically homogeneous, and basically Swedish-speaking Protestants, is the very bulk of the population, and then, largely culturally and ethnically heterogeneous Mexico, which has a huge variety in the population of ethnic groups in many, many languages. Most foreigners think only Spanish is spoken in Mexico. This is not true. A huge percent of the population don't even speak Spanish. They speak Nahuatl or, uh, or Yucatec Mayan 
or one of the other indigenous languages. And in those societies, you're tending to see much more coheistic behavior in such ethnically and culturally heterogeneous societies than in relatively homogeneous Sweden. Egalitarian policies in Mexico tend to be more destructive than they are in Sweden for that reason. But it's not as if there is no predatory behavior in Sweden. Talk to Swedes about that. And of course, there is rent-seeking and predatory behavior there as well. The power to take from Peter and to give to Paul means that all other things being equal, one should expect more investment by all the Pauls, and even some by the Peters, to get access to that power. And whoever holds that power will use it to benefit themselves. Now, those who favor putting more such power in the hands of politicians may not intend it, but they are promoting more cronyism, more unfairness, more inequality, both of power and of wealth. Moreover, they are promoting the vesting of more power not in the hands of the poor, but in the hands of those who are capable of to manipulate power. Those people will benefit. Often the same people who in the market would do better because they're more capable. They're better salespeople. Those people, when they get into politics, are better manipulating that system as well to their own advantage. Another French thinker, Bertrand de Juvenel, the lectures he gave in Cambridge University in 1950, published as The Ethics of Redistribution, summed it up. I recommend this book. It's a marvelous short book. The more one considers the matter, the clearer it becomes that redistribution is, in effect, far less a redistribution of free income from the richer to the poor, as we imagine, than a redistribution of power from the individual to the state. Now, in contrast to the redistributors, I'm a radical egalitarian. I put equality at the heart of my beliefs about justice. I believe in equality before the law, in what James Harrington called the empire of laws and not of men. The rule of equality and not the rule of privilege or poll. Now, if income were merely allocated or distributed by some impersonal process, it might make sense to intervene to create processes that generate a more fair distribution of that income. But that's not how the world works. Wealth and income are produced. They don't just happen, and they aren't just distributed or allocated. Moreover, we're not mere consumers of income, reduced to a de juvenile quote, gnawing, chewing on the income bone in our cages. We are engaged with other people. We are social beings. We do so on the basis of our legal equality. The latter spans, spans a practice of equality before the law rather than one law for you and another for me and my friends. What produced that world of equality to the degree that we enjoy it? It's liberalism. And I mean a liberalism that's not merely aspirational, that simply writes down on paper that everyone is equal, but a liberalism that focuses on the process that will allow people to take advantage of their equality. A liberalism that fights for the rights of people to better their own lives the lives of their families, and their communities, and of their neighbors and friends. So allow me to return to the case of falling global inequality by turning to India. What we have witnessed in India in just the past 23 years is astonishing. I hope that the next 23 years will surpass that. Hundreds of millions of people lifted from grinding desperate poverty to middle class lifestyles. It has had an especially powerful impact on the population known as Dalits, formerly called untouchables by outsiders. They are among the most oppressed people on the face of the earth. And since the founding of the Indian Republic, they have had formal equality in the law. But the reality of life in India was very different. It was still dictated by thousands of years of the caste system. But since 1991, where the aspirational claim to equality was coupled with the market freedom to improve one's status, that of one's family and community. Dalits have exploited that opportunity and changed India and the world. In a wonderful book, Dali Millionaires, by Milan Kandekar, he notes it's no accident most of the Dalit millionaires featured in the book started their businesses after 1991. It was the new market environment that put them on par with other players. 
What we favor is not simply equality of outcomes, but fundamentally equality of processes, equality before the law. The tendency of that is to generate outcomes that in the long run are more equal because they're less cronious. But the goal that we should focus on is equality of processes. To make a simple distinction, Aristotle distinguished between distributive justice and what he called corrective justice. Distributive justice had to do with the distribution of benefits in the community on the proper basis. Commutative justice, had, corrective justice, had to do with correcting problems in either voluntary or involuntary transactions. Thomas Aquinas improved that. He talked about commutative justice rather than corrective. It has to do with the justice that is transactions among persons. Now, some liberals have argued that we should get rid of any discussion of distributive justice and focus only on commutative justice, because I think distributive justice leads to socialism. I think that's a great mistake. You can't have commutative justice if you don't have, at some level, a conversation about distributive justice, about the baseline against which we measure whether actions are voluntary or involuntary. And the foundation is the right of every person to control his or her own life. That means working for the rights of the propertyless, such as those Barlow Mitchell is working with in India, to allow them to register what they own and to have a legal claim with it and the dignity that comes with that. Working with street vendors, as many of our partners do, people who have no legal existence, no legal dignity, and no rights against the police who harass them, shake them down, beat them. It means working for the rights of religious minorities who are persecuted in many countries, and even in some countries of religious majorities persecuted by minority regimes, of girls who are forced into sexual slavery at tender ages when we deny their rights to pursue education, careers and lives of their own. It means defending the rights of the most humble among us to due process of law, equal access to the courts of law, equality before the law, and in general the right to govern their own lives. That is the equality we as liberals favor. It is the reason we fight against statism, against favoritism, against inequalities in power, and the cronyism, corruption, and unfairness they spawn. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us work for what Adam Smith called the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice, and for a world in which the poor can rise up, rather than a world in which the rich are torn down. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have in fact um, running a little bit behind schedule. So what we're going to do is that we are going to take only two questions from the floor.